The Indians had a different, very different view of property. It wasn't something that could be bought and sold. Uh, it was something that could be, uh, uh, I suppose, leased is the word. Uh, it's something that uh, uh, you could uh, allocate to somebody for hunting or for fishing, and Indians did that among themselves. And the whites came in, so they said, yeah, okay, uh, you have the right to, uh, uh, to plant your crops there. Uh, without understanding that uh, this was an exclusive right, that it would never come back. Nobody can actually own a piece of land in their mentality. You know, it's just, it's Mother Earth, it's yours, you're there, you tend to it, you keep it, you raise it, you graze it. They came in with all these land grants and everything, and the Indians didn't understand the, the trading of ownership of land. They feel, all right, here, you want this piece of land, I signed this paper here, this is yours. I'll be back tomorrow to come and, you know, raise it and bring my sheep. They didn't understand the concept of once you sign that paper, that land is no longer yours. So they took advantage of the Indians because they were naive in that way, but they took advantage of them, and that's basically how they got their land from them. If they didn't get the land that way, then they did as Tom Hicks did with his people and came with their guns and raided them. In 1636, the Indians of Little Neck, New York, were part of the biggest massacre in the town's history. Yet one Indian family escaped the wrath of Thomas Hicks and the English. Evan Waters, an Englishman, was married to a woman from the Wampanoag tribe, and he was given a land grant from the English. Because of their survival, a new population would spawn in Little Neck, New York. This is James Barron, a descendant of the Waters family. He is now retired, but volunteers at the local ambulance corps. His ancestors used to own 10 acres of land, but over the years, piece by piece, it passed into the city's hands for payment of back taxes. He is now blocked in by his neighbor's fences and trees, landlocked, with no legal access to his home. Used to own what they used to own from Northern Boulevard, all the way what Marathon Parkway, ten acres. Before you know it, you didn't have anything. They landlocked us in here. We can't do anything about it. Cause all of my lawyers, all of my real estate lawyers, the father, the mother, the daughter, and the son, they were all real estate lawyers. So we had lawyers, but we got knocked down. We didn't win. What they basically wanted to do was knock down my father's house and they wanted to knock down my cousin's house and they wanted to build like a shopping mall. That's, that's what they planned on doing because they have the whole back area there behind the Scobies parking lot and then some to build a shopping mall. But it's not going to happen. They took the land away, you know. That was the only thing. Was there. And they tried to take this. It's not... Uh, the people around here tried to take this, this property very bad. They took the property in the front, they wanted to take this, and they wanted to take a cousin's property. They're constantly fighting about the right-of-way because God forbid there's a fire, or God forbid you need an ambulance, there's no way to get them. This is against the law, it should be. We're living in just blocks everywhere we go. We can't get in or out, and we, we've told many people, and uh, nobody does nothing about it. Native Americans were not citizens. They didn't become citizens until, what, 1924, 1926? And before that, they didn't have to pay taxes. So here they are on their homestead here in Little Neck, and then all of a sudden, boom, guess what? You have to pay taxes. Not only do you have to pay taxes, you have to pay back taxes. They lost their land. The 
city and you know the government says yes you gotta pay taxes so they got a lawyer this is the god honest truth they got out the wumpa the money all this money gave it to the lawyer saying we uh we are paying our taxes then came out the truth was that they never paid the taxes the lawyer was putting it in his pocket and taking the money and uh, they made him sign papers that they paid all. And all they knew how to do was put an X, put an N. So after a while, the city just said, no, no tax, no money. We set the property. And what happened? After they died, the property was gone to the city. So we lost it all. There was a graveyard on the Waters homestead until 1931. It was then that the city of New York decided that the land was needed for a highway. The bodies of the Waters family would have to be unearthed. My great-grandfather, William Davis, his great-grandmother purchased that land because it was a burial site since time immemorial. And she purchased it to protect it and preserve it as a burial site for hundreds of years. And no one still knows to this day how that happened, how that land transferred ownership into the city of New York and the county of Queens. But it did. And you can't find those records of that transaction anywhere. And they removed those bodies. And along with the removal, they took items from those graves and put them in the museum the Smithsonian Museum. So to me, that's a total desecration. Those are burial items. You don't take things from a grave site and place them in museums. It's a total desecration of, of, a, of a resting place. This is what they call an Indian trade rifle. The English made the mistake, and the traders made the mistake of trading this type of rifle to the Indians who almost successfully wiped out the settlers with this gun. The only thing that stopped them from doing it was that the Indians didn't know how to make gunpowder. This is Rock Waters, one of the original natives in Little Neck and cousin to James Barron. His house has been here since 1636. Northern Boulevard was only like a one lane, a lane and a half wide and uh, the property spread out into that area. And uh, there was no concern about whether it was a graveyard or not, especially if it was a minority graveyard or an Indian graveyard. I said, the heck with it, we're gonna move it anyway. But uh, my great uncle, um, uh, James Wild Pigeon, he was the one who fought them and kept them from moving the graveyard for a long, long time. The excavation of the cemetery wouldn't happen without a fight. The sachem, or chief as we call them today, was James Wild Pigeon Waters. He was a fighter, the leader of the Matinecock tribe, and a person who wanted only the best for his family. So he went to court and fought the city with everything he had, hoping to keep the graves intact. They came in, they had a sheet with so many graves that were marked that were gonna be excavated. After they dug them up, they came over to here to Zion's Churchyard Cemetery. They dug a big pit and threw the bodies right in the pit. My great-great-great-grandfather and grandmother are missing. They were not accounted for, as well as my great-great-great-great-grandparents as well they weren't accounted for. And there's a couple of other ancestors that didn't make the list that were reinterred here. They were either left in the cemetery or their bones that were just too many that they were just discarded. They uh, dug up whatever was there, threw it on the side, and uh, that was it. Anybody came along and would pick up uh, what they wanted, 
But then they shoveled some in a pile, and then they picked it up, and they claimed they put it in uh, Zion's Cemetery, which uh, that's hard to believe. It may have been very upsetting to the tribe when the city you know, decided to do this widening of Northern Boulevard, um, but I think they were very pleased that Zion Church came forward and helped them uh, come up with a solution that would be the reinterment and then a rededication. So I would hope that over the years, whatever upset feelings there were at that, um, have been healed and that the, the gesture from Zion Church uh, was a helpful part in that solution. It's a funny thing about this place, you know, about uh, the way this life is, the way people are. This is I could never understand anybody digging up bodies. I could never understand uh, how anyone in America could tolerate the desecration of graves. I mean, those are our ancestors. Those are our people who we, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, our uncles, our great-uncles, our ancestors, all of those people. We know who they are. We knew who they are. And to dig up those bodies to build a road, to me, it is one of the most wrongful things that we as human beings can do. It's like going to a cemetery and digging it up so you could put a McDonald's or something there. And for them to do that is, in my estimation, unforgivable. the bones, they took all the bones out of the cemetery, put them over Zion's, and I don't believe it. Half of the people are still there, and they just build the, the, uh, the buildings on top of it. They ain't even dug up the bones, they just left them in there. They don't care, these people don't care, they just want to get business out here. All these decisions were made without uh, consulting much with the uh, Matinecock at all. And so that was the one thing that James Waters was upset about, was that they had simply been uh, shut out of any, any kind of discussion. I mean, the assumption was that they, uh, that they were extinct. They didn't, there were no, uh, no Matinecocks left. Uh, if it were uh, a colonial graveyard, I'm sure that they would have found another way to uh, accommodate that without disturbing it. The lost souls were deterred in Zion's churchyard cemetery, which was adjacent to the land. They didn't receive their own plots and were dumped into a mass grave. Along with the bodies, other materials were unearthed. The grave goods. Many of the tomahawks, peace pipes, clothing, and artifacts that were ceremonially buried with Native Americans were not reinterred with the bodies. No report lists the artifacts that were found. In fact, the entire excavation wasn't documented with the city. It all just went missing. They were taken to the Hay Foundation, which is now the Smithsonian Museum. It's exactly where they went. The town supervisor uh, invited some people from the Hay Foundation, an anthropologist, to be there when they did the excavation, thinking that there might be other kinds of prehistoric burials there as well, and um, uh, other kinds of grave goods, because even in the uh, 18th century, when Indians were buried, they would be often the, the old custom of burial goods, pipes and, and bottles and, and, and uh, tools and so forth would be buried with them. And they were looking for, for things like that. The Hay Foundation had archaeologists at the cemetery during the excavation. George Hay, the founder and president, sought Indian artifacts for his personal collection. His findings were later passed on to the National Museum of the American Indian in New York City. And many of the artifacts ended up in the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C. 
Gustavus Hay was uh, made his money uh, on the railroads. He was one of the railroad tycoons. And uh, as the railroads were going out into the west, he was out there uh, buying Indian artifacts, uh, um, hundreds of thousands of Indian artifacts. He was buying uh, blankets right off the backs of the, the Indians, you know, that because uh, he had had the money and he was uh, uh, interested in uh, in setting up this this collection. And uh, he brought all the stuff back and he viewed it almost as his personal collection. But he was a very uh, uh, aristocratic guy. He didn't uh, have much uh, interest in Indians as human beings, only as artifacts. know that the articles that were removed from there, burial articles, medicine bundles, um, clothing, uh, items that we, we bury our people with were removed from that site. It could be tools, hatchets, knives, uh, could be a favorite coat, uh, it could be a pipe, uh, all these things. The, the basic uh, belief is that they'll use these in the, in the next world. These weren't for, to be put on a shelf. These weren't for, for somebody to keep and hang on a wall in their house as a decoration. These were for our ancestors, for, for them to, to take with them into their afterlife. And for them to take and put on a shelf isn't, isn't right. They belong back here where they were reinterred with them. Archaeology is a field filled with controversy. Professionals like Eugene Bosch are very sensitive when it comes to working with human burials. If you look at the history of, of archaeology, um, many of the people who did work uh, you know, 100, 100 plus years ago were, were amateurs, quasi-professionals. Uh, many of them were good and kept excellent records that are still of, of benefit today. but. You know, many others were less than, than rigorous, less than, uh, than um, you know, professional, uh, if you will. And uh, so it wouldn't surprise me that, uh, that many of these sites were, were excavated in, in ways that certainly wouldn't meet modern ethics or standards. But, uh, you know, people were interested in Native Americans like they always are, and they would get an idea that there's a burial ground or a village site somewhere, and they would just go out and and dig it to see what they find. So no, that doesn't surprise me at all. The idea behind archaeology is, is, is to find information. It's not necessarily to find, you know, quote, artifacts that are, that are interesting for display. Um, that, that seems to be kind of a, that, that's a bonus at the end. You know, if, if you do find something, it's, um, it, the, the public reacts well to that. You know, pe people feel a connection to something that's aesthetically pleasing. From the, from the context of the time, certainly today uh, you consider them uh, grave robbers, and certainly there, there you know, would be a, a double standard uh, which was out there. They wouldn't go to an identified you know, European cemetery and do that, but uh, you know, they would frequently go to you know, Native American cemeteries and, and loot or pillage or, or, or be grave robbers in, in the modern sense of the, of the term. The federal law says, in effect, that uh, the native group who has who lives in the area that's that uh, has a connection with the prehistoric Indians who are there, that group has to be involved. Uh, there are initiatives passed, such as NAGPRA, which is the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, that asked uh, museums to go back through their collections and inventory everything that they had um, that had uh, that had cultural patrimony attached to it, and. Um, Considering um, items from graves, um, uh, certainly human remains, uh, any, anything that's related to a burial, they were asked to, to send those inventories out for review to Native people that would be associated with them and ask if they would like them returned. You know, it's better that those artifacts be somehow you know, researched or, or analyzed so that they can contribute to our knowledge of prehistory and, and Native American culture. Um, than for those artifacts just to uh, you know remain in a in a storage cabinet. Um, the the problem is that you that you find with with those artifacts. Uh, I would assume this is an assumption is that uh, you know they've been excavated 60, 70, 80 years ago. They're sort of out of context. What's their you know association? So they 
their the information that they have is limited, but uh, the importance that they may have to uh, to the Matinecock or to other Native American groups is real, and uh, you know so they probably should be turned over. Well, the point is is that you wouldn't go in specifically just to quote dig up artifacts. Um you have to have a specific reason for doing what you're doing. Um, a question that you're trying to answer, I mean, even if it's as basic as who are these people, but there, there is no scholarly work that's been based on the cemetery on Northern Boulevard. You know, it's, it's never been published to my knowledge. Um, you know, other than idle curiosity or curio hunting, there doesn't seem to be any reason to have, uh, to have actually disturbed it. My question is, and I'll go on record saying this, is when are you an anthropologist and when are you a grave robber? If family of the people who are buried in those graves are still alive, what gives you the right to dig up those graves, one, and then plunder those graves to put this stuff in museums? Uh, I can understand ancient uh, archaeology to an extent, um, but to say just because they are Indians, and we have to find out what they buried there. We have a right to take it. Well, what about the family members who are sitting there saying, wait a minute, that's my great-grandfather, that's my father, that's my uncle, that's my brother. Are they going to dig up my grave too? Christians call them angels. Okay, We call them spirits. They are around us all over. And you can feel their presence. You can feel their presence when they're happy. You can feel their presence when they're sad. You can feel their presence when they're angry. For James Barron and his family, the spirits of their ancestors are still here, and they're angrier than ever. To them, the nighttime noises around the neighborhood are the lost souls protecting what's rightfully theirs. From lost land to the desecration of their cemetery, these spirits want revenge. This strip of stores hasn't been here for that long. One by one, year after year, a store would move out and a new one would come in. A few retail workers did admit that someone or something is here, watching trying to take back what's theirs. However, they refused to be filmed for this documentary. You can't build on top of cemeteries. This is not the Indian cemetery out here or any cemetery. You build on top. These, the bodies, the spirits do get angry. And uh, they get back. They get back at you. They tell you they got all the bodies out of there and, and put them in Zion's church and put a big rock there, but they didn't take all of them. They left a whole lot still there. That's why their spirits are going around and scaring the stores. First it was the fire. They didn't seem like, they don't know what happened, what started it. Because uh, first they thought it was a bad wire in a wall or something, but they wasn't sure. But the girl, was it working there, she was in the basement doing something. And the fire was upstairs. When it started, it started blazing, then they told the firemen, there's a girl downstairs, but they couldn't get her out. So she got burned up. She passed out, not just from the smoke, but she got burned up in the fire. So I go into the bank. The girl says, uh, Natalie, you show me the book of Little Neck, and I'm, I know I'm sitting on a graveyard. He says, uh, all of us go downstairs where the bulk is at. They all scared to go down there. I said, why? She says, every time I hear something banging against the bulk, the wall and things, I hear the noise. And everybody run upstairs, and they all scared to go down there. I said, you on a graveyard. There's one right over there in the buildings right behind us that's driving those people crazy over there. That's what I was just going to ask you. Do you think there's a... Yeah, there's one, but she's not our family. And they hear her screaming every once in a while. And a couple of people have told me they see her going back and forth between the buildings doing things. And uh, people who are honest enough will tell you they've seen things that they 
wish they hadn't seen. Spiritual beliefs vary in every Indian family and every culture. Indians of the Pacific Northwest believe that if a person dies, their spirit will bring bad luck. So they bury their bodies across a body of water or far from their village so they can't find their way back. Catholics believe that spirits are not men and women, but rather fallen angels masquerading as loved ones. Any message received from a deceased loved one is associated with demons. Buddhists pray to a spirit for good health, fortune, and protection. They present offerings of food or flowers to please the spirits. For the Matinecock tribe and others on Long Island, they need to bury the deceased with grave goods so they can take them to the spirit world. The spirit of our ancestors guide us in our lives and they protect us, and we ask them to help us, they will. Powwows, a tradition that has endured for generations, continues to grow year after year. Singing, dancing, and food are always the main attractions. It's a time for tribes and families from all over the country to meet and just have fun. You know, like spirits are in everything because you have like the spirit world and you have the physical world. And without the spirit world, the physical world can't grow, you know. It's like you have the grass, but the grass needs a spirit so that it keeps growing. You know, we all need some kind of like spark and electricity inside of us to keep us going. So that's where like the spiritual world comes in. And when we do the dances or, you know, we pray, we give thanks, something has to take our thoughts and our prayers up to the Creator, you know. So you're like, you pray. Do your ceremony, the spirits take your words up to the Creator, you dance in appreciation, the spirits watch, the Creator watches, you know. It's like, you know, it's all like a company, like in order to have a unit, you have to have like a bunch of workers focusing on one thing, and same thing with the, earth, with the world, you know, you have to have all these spirits looking, making sure everything's going right, because if not, then it's going to start to deteriorate, just like it has, because you see, every time we bring down the rainforest, or we cut something down, or we make the world less natural, it start, we lose some of those spirits, and the world becomes more desolate and dead. This here is coyote teeth. And these beads here I made from the foot bone of the coyote. Again, going back to my own culture and making beads from the bone. Lou Gilson is an Indian from Canada. He comes to the powwows in New York every year to showcase his creations and catch up with old friends. Over the years, he too has followed the controversy of the Waters Family Cemetery. It was a time when they didn't care much about native concerns uh, and you know they, it was common for them to pave over cemeteries for public things. I mean that happened in New York City too. They, several places where cemeteries where streets were needed so they paved over the cemetery. It was not an uncommon practice in the first half of the century uh, regarding natives or otherwise and so native cemeteries often suffered because they didn't have the resources to fight it if they wanted to. So then, as American citizens, we got the rights to be drafted and pay taxes. Of course, the elders didn't know this tax thing happening here. And every time that the government had some legal dealing with them, they'd have to have a lawyer to be represented. Money comes from where? So the lawyers would take and help out the elders and just take a little piece of land as a fee when you die. So a big piece of land that was gigantic uh, came into a small piece of land. The Little Neck Parkway, Northern Boulevard intersect, that's where our land is. Now it's a four highway, lane highway. Where do you think those other pieces of land came from? They gave my mother $75. And they, they said public domain. 
she said they told me either take it was like my mother and my brother and uh, Walter Hageman. And they basically said take it or take nothing and we'll take it. A reservation is a piece of land managed by Indians under the United States government. They must police themselves, take care of their own sewage, and find a source for water. This is the Poospatuck Reservation in Long Island, New York. They used to have one of the highest crime and drug use rates when compared to other cities in the area. 20 years ago, you couldn't walk here at night. The reservations I visited, uh Unless they were pumping a lot of oil, I wouldn't want to be on them. They were just ghettos, government ghettos, slums. The actual uh, life expectancy on a reservation is about half of what your normal life expectancy is off the reservation. If you look at the time period before the 1960s, both reservations, uh, Shinnecock and Puspatuck, were uh, extremely poor. Uh, the buildings were kind of run down and, uh, and the people themselves were not really expressing overtly a lot of Native American customs and practices. They may have done this quietly on their own, the uh, celebrations of, uh, of the, of the uh, fall harvest and so forth were going on, but as very quiet kind of family reunions. Reservations were set up specifically to isolate people. And uh, the only thing that has changed is the fact that, uh, for whatever reason, people have become politically correct and said, OK, we're going to recognize you, give you your own government and everything else. And the Indians finally, in some cases, stuck it back to the oppressor and came up with gambling casinos and are now becoming very wealthy, especially like in the state of Connecticut. They own almost two thirds of the state of Connecticut, which is kind of nice. In 1994, a new chief took the reins and began his mission to clean up this reservation. That chief was Harry Wallace. He's a lawyer and has dedicated most of his life to keeping the land pure and profitable to make new lives for the Indians living here. You began to get better education. You began to get uh, more economic wealth on the reservations. Uh, once a smoke shop thing hit, then there was more money available. Uh, and Harry Wallace has used that to, to uh, uh, improve the, uh, the uh, physical conditions of the reservations. Uh, a lot of changes took place there in the economic structure. More and more became middle class and uh, became teachers and workers in the healthcare system and, uh, and so forth. The majority of the people living on the reservation are direct blood relatives of James Barron and his siblings. Yet unlike them, James himself is not recognized by the city or state as a Native American. There are thousands of tribes that aren't recognized and countless individuals that have been overlooked. If you're a recognized Indian by New York State, you're eligible to receive free health care and you don't have to pay taxes. However, if you're only recognized by New York City, you're able to receive unlimited prescription medications. With James in his retirement years, he could use all the benefits he could get. Every city and state may offer different incentives for being recognized as a native, but in order to show proof, you need original certificates and documents going back hundreds of years to prove your bloodline and relationships. Birth certificates, death certificates, medical records, James and his family have submitted everything, twice, and are still waiting for an answer. The message started to get around the country. Other tribes heard that the Matinecocks were looking for artifacts given to the Smithsonian, and immediately letters from fellow Indians started coming in, expressing their support. Standing Bear is a native from Oklahoma, and he too felt the pain. One day a package arrived with a hand-woven craft, and Chief Harry Wallace deciphered it. For the natives, Stories are mainly told through pictures, like those of their ancestors who used to inscribe on walls. In this story, the members of the Matinecock tribe were commended for their efforts. It told how the Indians from east to west, no matter how far apart, 
would always show their care and support and help them persevere through the worst. Through missing artifacts, a wrongfully moved cemetery, or a landlocked piece of property. For natives, it's intrinsic to nurture and preserve the land as it is, teaching others to care for it too. The ongoing battle for sovereignty is a continuing injustice. You know, the lack of recognition of treaty rights, long preserved and protected, is a constant injustice. You know, people think that because we're able to sell unstamped product or un quote unquote untaxed product, it's something we've always done. It's only recently when the uh, outside world has overburdened their own population that it's become an issue. Okay, so now they want to infringe upon our ability to protect our own people. It's not about taxes, it's not about you know, gas, it's not about, you know, gaming or any of those things. It's about our tradition, our language, our way of life. And that's what's called sovereignty. And that's what's called walking a, a, the, the good road. One day, there was a family working on a home in Long Island, and during the construction, an Indian corpse was discovered. The corpse was turned over to the closest tribe and traced back to the original family. A burial was scheduled shortly after to reinter what was left of the body in a secret location. Local tribes were present, as were family members, museum reps, and even archaeologists. Because of the sacred quality of a native funeral proceeding, cameras had to be turned off. They, they put a, an Indian blanket over the coffin, and they all walk down to the, to the graveyard. And once they get to the graveyard, they sit the casket there, and they make a big circle around them. And first they start singing in an India prayers and stuff, you know. And after that's all over, they come the peace pipe. Just the members, the close members of the person who's in the casket smoke the peace pipe. They pass it all around. This burial today does give some closure to the tribes, to know that this person is now finally in a peaceful ground, on his way to the spirit world. Clothing and grave goods were interred with the body, just as they had been with his past relatives. His descendants can only hope that the grave remains untouched for the years to come. Little Neck, a year later, James is still trying to get rid of an abandoned boat, but no one will move the fence. As a last resort, he is being forced to dismantle it and carry the pieces out one at a time. Here we asked him if we could take the fence down because we'd put the fence back up even. No. We asked him if it would give us the right of way for the driveway and we could get it out that way. No. You can see the car now. Garbage cans. That's our problem. I think they didn't care. Greenberg told them I want to fence up. They found out their, their boundaries and they just put the fence up. They didn't get. We wouldn't have had this gate here if it wasn't for Barry going to the, what, the father? Yeah. You know what I mean? I said, I'll give you a little gate with a lock. Yeah. You're responsible for it. You can lock it, you know, whatever you want to do. But it, that'll be yours as long as the fence is up. We probably would have got the fence taken down mm -hmm. if the old man was still alive because he was nice. He died, so that's where we stuck. And the wife forget, you can't talk to her. Have you tried talking to them lately or at all in the past? Nah, it's like talking to the tree. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's what, yep. Well, I'd be happy if they gave us a big gate. 
I don't even pay for the damn gate. Where you can slide it open, I can drive my car in here <laughs> and close the gate. I'll be happy. They won't even do that. Isn't it? They wanted this property one time, Barry told them no. So they, because they own, they own this here. They own all this back here. And we're in the middle of their property. See, they want to expand their, their parking lot and put like a baby mall in here. And we stopped them. What happens if there's a fire back here? Where are the fire trucks? How can they come in? Especially if, if it's like mid, midday over here. This parking lot is like this. How would a fire truck get back here? They have to stop out there, the hydrants out there, and they'd have to run, run all the way up here with the hose. <laughs> When they put the fence up, they promised me lights a long time ago. Because uh, what happened uh, for the lights, uh, a waitress from Scobie was raped back here. In the summertime, forget about it. There's all kids back here, beer drinking and doing, you know, sort of things. There's drug dealing going back here. Uh, and it's still going on. Nothing's being done. And I, I, I got in the middle of the parking lot, I got bumped on the head. Coming home from work, bumped on the head. Right in this parking lot. Uh, and you say all that to the owner or to the cops, you know. There's nothing they can do, they say. It's their property, right? All we can do is just come when you call. And it's still going on. Are Indians forgotten? The question looms from time to time, but can never really be answered. Their history is displayed for us in museums across the world, but there always seems to be an instance when someone asks the question, what's an Indian? In a time period you're talking about, uh, the Indians uh, were really a forgotten minority, if you will, or ignored minority. Occasionally, uh, when a village would have a, a hundredth anniversary or something, they would look around to see if they could find anybody who was a local uh, elderly person who could claim Indian ancestry and put a war bonnet on them and trot them out in their, their parade and so forth, sitting with the mayor or something like that. Yeah. And they're not forgotten because economically they're becoming powerful. The sad part of it is that Indians who were never racists as a group are now becoming racists against their own. Because if you're not all Indian, then you're not Indian. Because they're falling into this game of, uh, well, you know, he's, he's only 40%, so he's only 10%. But now, because it's economically powerful for the tribes, you have to prove, you have to prove with your bloodlines and everything else that you're more Indian than anything else. If you can't prove it, then we have certain tribes that are just saying you're not Indian. It just seems that every time there's a chance for the Matinecock's voice to be heard in, in Queens, it, it, it's put down immediately. Um, it, it just seems like there have been so many plans for you know, a meditation garden or a community center or you know, any number of, of opportunities and nothing ever comes of it. You know, it, it, it's like if you, if, you don't, if you don't acknowledge that they're here, you don't have to listen to their voice. And uh, that's, that's, the, that's probably the most unfortunate part about, uh, about you know, Native Americans in, in Queens. It's, it's almost like you don't have a fighting chance. They're trying to wipe out any existence of the Native American. They're trying to make it where it's Dutch and English owned and Dutch and English founded. And they're trying to wipe out any memory 
or any history of the Indians. I believe that they would love to wipe out the Indians and make them a forgotten people. But because of the Native Americans themselves, they're not going to let that happen. I'm not going to let that happen. But, uh, when they say the last of the Tenecox, I, I always laugh. Oh, this is something I'll add. If the last of the Matinecox is buried there, who am I, who are you, who's your mom, who's all of our relatives who came after them? It's, the, it's always been the, the purpose of the government to love our Indians but to do away with them, to make them disappear, to assimilate. They're not around anymore. It's always the last of. I can show you in that book when always it says the last of this, the last of that. And then it says, survived by. You, you get it? <laughs> the last Narragansett squaw survived by her uncle, niece, nephew. Give me a break. Come on. How hypocritical. Yeah. A lot of people, they don't even know what it is anymore. Like his sister. Remember that, that guy, the little kid went up to her? You Indian? What's the Indian? Yeah, man. Because the people today, they don't say anything, you know, teach their kids about Indians. They just, you know? So we're getting the real history. First of all, Native Americans are not a minority in the sense of, you know, a small group. We are a political entity whose rights and responsibilities and obligations are guaranteed by treaties with England, Holland, France, Spain, Sweden, Russia, Germany, all of these nations, the United States, and ultimately the United States. These are political treaties entered into between two sovereigns. We are not a designated minority in New York State, but we are a political entity whose numbers have been reduced by war, disease, overpopulation, and genocide. So we're not forgotten. They'd like to forget about us, but every once in a while, we remind them that we're still here. And our presence can, cannot be forgotten because we are the caretakers of this land. We are the ultimate caretakers of this land. And if you destroy the remaining population of Native people, we are the things that stand between you, their lives, and ultimate destruction. That's why our presence is so important to be here. Because as a, we have the responsibility to care for this land and an obligation to show others how to do that. So we're not forgotten. The story of the Matinecock tribe and the Long Island Indians will continue into a new chapter with its newest member, River Streb, the great-granddaughter of James Barron, born on May 15, 2009. In 1636, Thomas Hicks came to Long Island for control of the North Shore. The survival of the Waters family bears witness to the attempted destruction of their tribe and created a unique society in Little Neck, New York. The natives here bring a fresh historical voice to those curious about the past, along with traditions and culture that cannot be mimicked or replaced.
James has been through a lot in the past few decades, which were filled with stress and anger. The death of his brother during this time didn't make things easier. But as he ages through his retirement years with his sister Natalie, they can look back on what they helped accomplish and the mark they've left on society. The mark of a proud Native American family from Queens, New York, with the desire and passion to strengthen the Native voice throughout the world. Oh, she knows.